She was just four miles away from her parents' home, and it was in broad daylight. Somebody took her, and somebody killed her. But who? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Dana Sidham. Viewer discretion is advised. Dana Linnell Stidham was born on March 8th, 1971, and she was born in Gravette, Arkansas. She had a brother named Larry. They got along really well. Actually, at the time of this case, she is 18 years old, and she's actually living with her brother and her cousin in an apartment. And I believe they were living in Bella Vista, Arkansas. It was July 25th, 1989. Dana was going to visit her parents. Her mom and dad, Lawrence and Georgia, they lived in Hiwassee, Arkansas, which was literally just a couple of miles away from where she lived. She goes to their home. She has a wonderful little visit. Everything seems great. She leaves their house at 2.45 p.m. She then drives a couple of miles away about four miles from her parents' home, and she was going to be going to the Phillips grocery store there, I guess to pick up a couple of things for her dad who was feeling ill. So around that 2.45 p.m. time, she gets into her 1984 Dodge Omni, and she heads over to the Phillips grocery store. However, Dana never made it back to her parents' home. After a couple of hours, her parents thought it was just very strange that Dana had gone to the store, which was literally just a few minutes down the road, just to get some items and some medicine for her dad, but how come she isn't back yet? That's just odd. Dana adored her father, and especially since he's sick, she would never just sort of like leave him hanging like that. Uh, she would, she was always very responsible. Just the person she was, she should have been back to their house within minutes. And so they just had a really bad feeling about this. So her mom gets into her car and she drives to the Phillips food store to see if anyone can recall seeing Dana there, or maybe Dana is still there. She doesn't find Dana, but there are employees who say that they definitely saw her there. They then drive around to see if they can maybe find her car somewhere. Maybe her car broke down and that's why. They would have, they got, they drove down the path, the roads that she definitely would have taken, but they didn't find her car. But the employees at the store confirmed that Dana picked up the items and the medicine for her dad. So something had to have happened when she left that store. Like someone had to have approached her or something. So then Dana's parents begin calling around. They're calling to her friends and acquaintances, people she knows, but nobody has seen her. Nobody has heard from her. But also knowing that Dana is 18 years old, she is a responsible adult at this point. She lives on her own, kind of, and they just figured, okay, maybe she just got distracted by something and she'll be home. But by nine o'clock, she doesn't arrive back to her parents' house. She doesn't arrive to her own apartment and still nobody has seen her. So then her brother, Larry, contacts the Benton County Sheriff's Department and reports his sister missing. And then they send out an alert to everyone, basically be on the lookout for this particular vehicle, be on the lookout for this particular person. The following morning at approximately 6.30, a police officer was actually on her way to work when she was driving down the uh, Highway 71 and she spots a vehicle pulled off to the side of the road with the door open. Open, the, the driver's side door open. This is about a mile away from the Phillips food store. So when the officer gets to the station, she finds out, uh, that's when she finds out about this car they're supposed to be looking for. And then she goes, oh, I just saw that car. So now everyone books it out to where that car was. And lo and behold, it's, it's there. The keys were still in the ignition. The door was partially open, the window was rolled down, and there was a flat tire. Dana wasn't anywhere near the car. None of her belongings, like her purse and wallet and whatnot, none of them were found in the car. But there was a receipt sitting on this on the uh, passenger seat, and it had a timestamp from Phillips Food Store at 3.17 p.m. So they know 
she left that store at 3.17 p.m. But there was no sign of foul play in the car. No broken windows, no blood, no hair, nothing. Police were kind of working with this theory. Okay, she had a flat tire. Maybe someone came to her aid and possibly she willingly got into their vehicle under the ruse of this person saying, okay, we'll go get you a tire or I'll bring you somewhere to get some help for your car. But that was weird to her parents and her brother because like she left the keys in the car in the ignition and the door open. Like that was just, it was unusual. She wouldn't have just left all of it out in the open like that. She would have taken the keys and locked the car, rolled up the window. That's when some witnesses would come forward to state that, that at one point they saw Dana's vehicle on the side of the road where it eventually was found and that there was another vehicle parked behind that one, hers. However, they get very vague descriptions of the car and who a person they may have seen with that car. It's very, it's just not really detailed. But they begin to search that area. They are combing the entire like circumference of where this car was found. And they, they did find something. They found Dana's personal items, like her ID and stuff were like in this clear plastic bag. They also found some of her clothing items that were just sort of thrown on the side of the road in these like bushes and stuff. The items like her ID and, and, and stuff like that, like little things that were normally in her purse were all just found scattered outside of it, even though her purse wasn't found. Like they found things like family photos, her checkbook, just random little things. There were people within the police department who were like, well, we still don't have signs of foul play which is kind of a strange thing to say considering you found all these random belongings, but who am I to say? But her family was like, There's, she didn't leave on her own. This is not, she didn't do this. Like someone did something to her and we're telling you, we know our daughter and police were kind of like leaning on the fence of, well, does she do it something to herself or did someone take her and kill her? Well, the answer came about two months later. On September 17th, a hunter found human remains. This hunter says, I actually found these remains yesterday, but I didn't call until today. Uh, they were like skeletal remains of a person. This guy said that I didn't call you guys the day I found it because I was like doing something. I had to like, I was hunting and I didn't want to like lose track of time. So it's like, they're not going anywhere, right? The skeleton, so I'll just call you guys tomorrow. Okay, bud. So the police finally gets to where these skeletal remains are found. They are in this like shallow uh, creek bed that's been dried out. It was literally a hundred feet away from like a, a neighborhood. The There was still clothing items on this body and they matched the description of clothing Dana was last seen in. And then they finally brought in dental records and they confirmed that unfortunately these were the remains of 18 year old Dana Stidham. It was clear that her body had once been buried in a very shallow grave, but there had been a lot of storms over that two month period. And also there's a lot of animals in this area. And so it's believed that just over time, her remains got dug up. Next to where the bones were found, they also found a t-shirt and some like shoes and there was duct tape around the shirt. So obviously it appeared that she had been kidnapped and bound probably with duct tape, possibly rope as well. But in terms of her cause of death, they said she definitely died from a homicidal violent attack. They weren't 100% certain, but it did seem that she had been stabbed likely in the neck based on some injuries to the neck bones. They believe that she was likely stabbed there. So now this is a murder investigation and they are having a hell of a time really trying to find out who did this. Dana didn't have any like jilted ex-lovers. She didn't have any enemies that anyone knew about. No like disgruntled co-workers or anything like that. Everyone just like loved her. Everyone they interviewed had nothing but nice things to say about her, which if you're the killer, you're probably not gonna talk crap about the victim. Obviously you're gonna probably say, oh yeah, I loved her. One name did come up uh, initially by Dana's friends, a man named Michael McMillan. I guess he had gone to Gravette High School with Dana. And apparently during the high school years, which was literally just like recently in this, uh, he had this weird kind of borderline obsession with her and she wasn't really reciprocating the feelings. He never came off as like frightening or terrifying to her. 
She never really told anyone, like, I'm afraid of this guy. He was just kind of, like, sort of in love with her, I guess, and was trying to maybe ask her out or go out with her, but, you know, he, she just wasn't, she just didn't want that. So police bring him in for questioning. He didn't really have a very good alibi. He really couldn't, there was no one who could say for certain where he was because he had been driving around in his dad's vehicle that day. He did completely and fully cooperate with police though. One very strange thing though about him is that, so he had joined the Navy and he left Arkansas when, and so he didn't attend her funeral. So he comes back later and apparently while her temporary uh, grave marker is there, he steals it. And then he admits to stealing it later. And he would later say, I just wanted something to remember her by. He said, I, I know that they, this was just a temporary thing and they were gonna give her an actual you know, plaque or a stone. So I just took it so I can remember her. Okay, Michael, that's odd still. There wasn't any physical evidence to suggest he killed her. They didn't find a single shred of evidence to say he did this. Nothing. No witnesses. Nothing. In 1996, they, the case is already pretty cold. They bring in some new investigators to look into this, and they actually find... They track down Michael's dad in the truck he was driving the day Michael said he was driving around. And they actually were able to process that truck for forensic evidence. And they found some hair samples in the car that were consistent with could have belonged to Dana. However, there was no roots attached to those hairs, which means there was no possible chance of getting DNA from them. So they have no idea who those hairs belong to. They then kind of work under the theory, maybe she was killed by a serial killer. I mean, this, that's not too far out of the realm of possibility. Could have been a random thing that this serial killer, she just fit his type and she was just one of many victims. They didn't know. They were just sort of throwing it out there as an option. And then fast forwarding to 2013, the Benton County Sheriff's Department arrests a man named Mitchell Goodwin. He was 62 years old in, in 2013. So he was arrested for shooting a woman in her face. And, and she actually survived that shooting unbelievably. And apparently sh he shot her because she had just inherited some money. And he's like, you know what? I want that money. So I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to take the money. Well, he failed. I guess where he shot her was really close to where Dana Stidham's body was found. And for whatever reason, they said, hmm, maybe he's a suspect in this case. They didn't really have anything to go on with that. They just said it's a maybe. I mean, he's a violent guy. Uh, he lived in the area when Dana was killed. Maybe it was him. Uh, okay. But uh, again, no forensic evidence linked to this man either. As of 2022, they said they still have Michael McMillan kind of on their radar as a possible person of interest. But again, with no evidence, no testimonies, no witness statements, no anything to suggest he did this, they can't do anything about it. They simply don't have proof that he did it. And there's a very solid chance that he didn't do this. Sure, he kind of looks like your prototypical, uh, you know, uh, this person's not gonna love me back, I'm gonna kill her. Happens all the time, unfortunately, so he fits the bill, but it doesn't mean he did it. But they also can't prove that he didn't do it, so it's it's up in the air. They really don't have any genuine suspects that they can say, we're very confident that this is the person who did this. They had very vague descriptions of this car that may have been seen parked behind her car when she disappeared. Very vague descriptions of a potential guy, but again, there was like, no one really knew. There's no description of him. So is this the possible killer? Sure, but who is it? Uh, it's not known. No arrests have ever been made in this case. No charges have ever been placed on anyone. And the murder of Dana Stidham has gone unsolved. The case was really just cold from the day she was found. If they have forensic evidence like DNA or fingerprints, they haven't said it to the public. It's very possible they have that evidence and they just don't want to say it because, you know, they want to be able to make sure they have the right person and they want to release as little of information as they can so that if the actual killer says something and slips, they know, oh, this is the, this is the one because we didn't release that information to the public. 
Dana Siddham was an 18-year-old girl who was friendly. She was happy. She was just living a good life. She didn't really have a lot of plans for her future. She kind of was just taking it day by day. And that was good for her. That was okay for her. She liked it. That's the way she just wanted to live her life at that point, much like a lot of us. But if she was going to have this prominent future doing something, we'll never get to know what that was. Because someone, possibly a stranger, possibly someone she knew, decided to take that away from everyone. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have information about the murder of Dana Stidham, please contact the Benton County Sheriff's Department at 479-271-1008. And if you have information that can help solve this case, you can always report it anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So please help Dana Sidham and her family get the justice she rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe, give this video a like so more people can see it. Follow me over on my TikTok pages if you want to. Those pages are linked in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links to my TikToks also come up here at some point in the beginning and around the end of this video. So check it out if you like. Also in the link tree, you'll find my merch store. We sell like t-shirts and hoodies. We do ship all over the world. So check it out if you want. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email, uh, short, simple, and sweet, just with the name of the individual or the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to the list. The list is gigantic. I pick my cases at random. I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. So yeah. So yeah, do that if you want to. But that's it for this video, True Crime Arunis. So until the next case, ta-ta for now, True Crime Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dong. Mm.